True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. If we go inside the mind of the individual and understand the factors that were driving it, we can see that there was actually a kind of crazy that is understandable logic. Let's get inside the mind of Stephen Grant. Prior to February 9th, this was a man who had dropped out of college. He was basically having, as the Detroit press does not tire saying, uh, Mr. Mom kind of role at home. His wife had an increasingly jet-setting role with Washington International Group. She was away Monday through Friday. He felt increasingly frustrated, powerless, angry. He said in an interview with the Detroit press that he felt like she was treating him like a valet that it felt like she was trying to be the boss when he should have really been the boss. He said that she was a bad mother. There was a question whether or not Tara was cheating with someone that she had met in San Jose, and they did go to counseling for this. And an ex-girlfriend of Grant's reported on February 20th that Grant had actually installed uh, surveillance devices on the computer to see if she was cheating. So what do you have? You have a guy of limited intelligence, of limited emotional ability, who is becoming increasingly frustrated, increasingly angry, sitting there at home, alone, with the kids, while his wife is flying around, with nothing but time to become angrier and angrier and angrier. February 9th comes around, she comes home, there's a blow up, this man of limited capacity, this psychopath, blows up, and now he starts to cover his crime. This is a frustrated, angry, psychopathic, sane man. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. If you're a parent thinking of becoming one, or if you just want to laugh at two new parents, here's a new podcast for you. You have some experience with this, Dick. New parents calling you at all hours of the day and night. <laughs> Yes, I've taken my share of those. I really miss it now that I'm retired. So this podcast, it's called Josie and Johnny Are Having a Baby With You. The show follows comedians Josie Long and Johnny Donahue through their not totally planned pregnancy as they try to prepare for the birth of their first child. It's real insight into how we all deal with the challenges of parenthood and parenthood-to-be. In each episode, Josie and Johnny sit down with actors, writers, and entertainers who are also parents, to help them figure things out. They talk to people like John Hodgman, Jane Marie, Eugene Merman, and Rachel Sklar. Listen and subscribe to Josie and Johnny Are Having a Baby With You in your podcast app right now. On February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2007, stay-at-home dad Stephen Grant called the Macomb County Sheriff's Office in Michigan to report that his wife, Tara Lynn Grant, had been missing for five days. In his story to police, Stephen claimed that this was not the first time Tara had taken off, which was why he hadn't reported her missing sooner. Stephen said that on the evening of February 9th, he and Tara had argued. He then overheard Tara talking with someone on the phone, telling them, I'll meet you at the end of the driveway. He said he saw her get into a dark-colored car a few minutes later, and he had not seen or heard from her since. Over the next two weeks, Stephen Grant made several TV appearances pleading for Tara to return. According to police, Stephen Grant was not cooperative with them throughout this investigation, and they began to question his relationship with the family's 19-year-old au pair. Investigators would ultimately discover that Stephen's story of a missing wife was untrue and was, in fact, an elaborate attempt to sidetrack the police. According to later confessions, Stephen killed his wife during an argument after she had slapped and belittled him, according to him. But insights into the couple's relationship and evidence uncovered by the investigation have made this one of the most shocking and disturbing crimes in Michigan's recent history. And that's really saying something. Join us at the quiet end today for our discussion of the life and the gruesome murder of Tara Lynn Grant in Blood on His Hands, the murder of Tara Lynn Grant. I'm glad we got a Michigan case. Are you? Yes, because I've been wanting to review 
Founders Breakfast Stout. That's Founders Brewing Company in Grand Rapids. I can't believe you haven't done it yet. You've been drinking it for years. I know. And I've uh, just been waiting, sometimes losing hope. (laughs) But it's there. You poor thing. Okay. And and the thing that bothers me even, even more so is that Grand Rapids is about three hours from your parents' house. So even when we were visiting your parents, it's not like you can just hop in the car and drive out to the brewery. Sure. Anyway, breakfast stout is an imperial stout. It's a black color, nice tan head, quickly disappears. Chocolate and coffee in the aroma. Just very rich, great aroma. And when you start sipping it, the chocolate hits you first. Kind of sweet, kind of bittersweet. I'm trying to make up my mind if it's a milk chocolate or a dark chocolate. But this definitely chocolate. That quickly goes into some nice espresso or or dark roast coffee. Wonderful beer. It's a very rich beer. Good beer to have for breakfast. I think that's why they call it breakfast stout. I guess, yeah. I'm not I don't think they really did it that way. But it's uh, got enough of a coffee sense that you feel like it's a breakfast drink. And wasn't there some controversy with the label at some point? Well, the label shows a baby eating a bowl of oatmeal. And I don't remember which state, although I think it was New Hampshire. They were going to forbid the selling of that beer because of the label in New Hampshire. But it doesn't show a baby drinking beer. No. That's weird. Okay. Well, cooler heads prevailed eventually. Good deal. Okay, why don't you open it up and we'll head down to the quiet end. Let's go. All right. Nice, warm fire going. Why don't you start us out? Okay. So life in Michigan's Upper Peninsula has a slow pace that provides relaxation in an isolated, beautiful environment. For Tara Lynn Grant, who was born with a driving ambition for more in life, the UP was a home that she loved, but stifling too, with little opportunity. The small towns and a heavily forested landscape were closed off from the rest of the world. Tara learned at an early age that a bigger world was out there, and she wanted to be part of it. Yes, she was born in 1972. She was the first child of Mary and Gerald, who was known to everyone as Dusty Destromp. I think I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. The family lived in Escanaba, where Tara was born, but moved north to Perkins when she was just 21 months old. Three years later, her younger sister, Alicia, was born. Perkins is kind of crude in some spots. It's a hard-edged community, kind of a different slice of humanity, if you will. What passes for the town, a little south of the farm that the Destramp settled on, was a blinking traffic light, a general store, a couple of churches, and a bar. It is surrounded by back roads that lead to more back roads with lots of potato farms and evergreen trees. Family members in this area are generally close, and they spend their entire lives there. But Tara was determined that this would not be her life. Whatever her friends hoped and dreamed of, like marriage, children, and a home nearby, Tara had other bigger plans that didn't match those of her peers. Yeah, she was going places. Absolutely. Very ambitious young lady. She was. Her mother, Mary, was a very religious person, also was a stickler for tradition. She worked in Escanaba as a dental hygienist. Her husband, Dusty, was a utility worker at K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base, which is about 30 miles north of them. A Dusty clashed with Tara when she was a teen. I guess most fathers clash with their daughters when they're teens, don't they? I don't know. At, at least to some extent. I guess I did with my dad, and you did with at least one of your daughters, so yeah. Yep. But the two would hunt rabbit and deer every weekend during the season, and Tara wanted to please him. But they were too similar, and they often had arguments and conflicts. Their home was off the main road on 28 rugged acres, behind a wall of pine and apple trees. They had a small pole barn, a larger wooden barn, and an animal pen where Tara kept her livestock. Goats, chickens, a few cows. The closest neighbors were about 200 yards away. Now, as an annual tradition, the family invited friends over to help with the groves of maples, collecting the raw sap and boiling it, and then bottling the syrup. 
As a child, Tara wore pigtails. She was a chatty kid. Her parents began rewarding her for keeping quiet at school because teachers complained of her constant talking. So if she got through the day without being corrected by a teacher, she would get a stick of gum. Positive reinforcement. Yes, exactly. By high school, Tara was active in a wide range of school activities, including playing clarinet in the school band and also cheerleading. She graduated third in her class, and there were only 40 in the whole class, in 1990. So that is tiny, if you can think about that, a class of 40. That's a tiny class. It sure is. While Tara's accomplishments were above average, they were fueled by competition with her sister Alicia. Most people thought that the two girls were close, but it would turn out that in Tara's view, they were also rivals. Life at the Destramp house was not boring. There were loud arguments, a lot of swearing, and that was sometimes shocking to Tara and Alicia's girlfriends. The Tara, family was outspoken. Tara had quite a mouth. Yes, and she learned it at home. Right. Yes. Well, where else? No. <laughs> <laughs> True. But yeah, I mean, she, she was known to drop the F-bomb on more than one occasion. I can't fucking believe it. Something like that. Something like that. Well, as she grew older, Tara's personality became even more determined, more willful, and very strong. She was raised without a lot of boundaries, and her parents always let her know that she could do anything she set her mind to. Tara had a love of material things and wanted to earn a lot of money. Dusty and Mary were very frugal, farm-type people. Now, Mary and Dusty actually collected cans and bottles and cashed them in for the deposit money. And Dusty would brag that he bought the last round of groceries with that money, one family friend would recall. So you can imagine this was embarrassing to teenage girls, especially Tara, who had some ideas about moving up in the world. Oh, I'm sure. So Tara had a nickname, and that was Terror. <laughs> and she earned it in the way she ran her life. She was a smart, controlling kid, a very type A personality from a young age. And that attitude was evident in her first serious high school relationship with classmate Jamie Hansen. He was in love with her from the time they dated in high school, and they were an item off and on during the two years she spent at Bay de Nord Community College in Escanaba, and later when both left the area to attend Michigan State University in East Lansing. So their public arguments created Tara's reputation for having a temper and a mouth. <laughs> Tara would verbally attack her boyfriend with no regard as to who was around. Once, she even burst into Jamie's home while his parents were there and told him off in no uncertain terms. No, so this was a little over the top. She had a lot of energy, a lot of uh, moxie, get up and go, whatever you want to call it. But some of this didn't set well with the boys because she was so controlling. It wasn't easy for them all the time. I can imagine. And this will come into play with her relationship with her husband, of course, later. Sure. So it was the summer of 1994 when Tara, wrapping up her business administration studies and focusing on her academics, met Stephen Grant, and she met him through her roommates. Steve had moved out of an apartment that he'd shared the previous nine months with some friends and was living in a small complex called the Oaks with two female friends while Tara was living in a student settlement called Cedar Village with one of Steve's old roommates and another friend. So there was a lot of group get-togethers when they first met. Yeah, it's almost like six degrees of separation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now Steve was instantly attracted to her, but Tara didn't immediately share those feelings. Steve was talkative and a bit of a braggart. He played up the city boy image because he was from Detroit. But he really liked Tara's aggressiveness and how it blended with her small-town innocence. But his know-it-all personality really put her off at first. So when he asked her out, she turned him down. He was really different from the small-town guys she'd grown up with. She was used to being in charge and in control, and he was a little off-putting for her. Well, he wasn't as submissive as she figured he should be, right? Perhaps. And a little obnoxious, maybe, some people have said. He could be a little too much, too. Yeah, that was a recurring theme. So I could that see is. how these two personalities would clash. Yep. He was kind of a know-it-all. And, and he always, you know, drove the best car, ate the best foods, 
went to the best gym, you know, stuff like that. And a lot of it was lies is another problem. He was kind of a phony. Yeah. Yeah. He would make up things to try and impress her and other people. Right. And she was a little bit superficial in that regard, too. She was superficial, but she wasn't a liar like he was. No, she wasn't. So Steve's job at the time was in the office of State Senator Jack Faxon. So that was attractive to Tara that he had a job like that. Well, yeah. She decided there might be more to him than met the eye when she saw that he might end up with a career in politics. Yeah, and he also often talked of his aspiration to become a lawyer. She liked that. Which she would like. So Tara thought Steve was someone who had his ambitions together, and he was headed toward a goal, which is where she was at. Yeah, exactly. She, She's she very goal-oriented. Goal. So she eventually warmed to the idea of a relationship, partly because of how she perceived Steve, and partly because Steve was just a persistent little bugger who wouldn't give up. Yes. So he was sure she was the right girl for him, and he had let it be known to her that he was not giving up. So finally she agreed to a date. And on that first date, he gave her a tour of Detroit, and he took her through Gross Point, where they could look at all the mansions, and he could show her that Detroit had a really nice side. And he knew this would appeal to Tara. Then they had lunch in Greektown, and they went to the Detroit Institute of Arts. So this all went really well. He put together a good date that impressed her. They had a good time. And then she agreed that she would see him again. But he didn't really win her over until a few weeks later. Yeah, he showed up uninvited to Tara's grandfather's funeral. And he was very charming. He introduced himself to her family as her boyfriend. Now this impressed Tara that he would make the effort to drive the several hours to the funeral. And the relationship became more serious afterwards. Tara seemed to be genuinely in love with him. Well, yeah, and she was actually there with her old boyfriend. And Steve just kind of came in and took over, and she broke up with the old boyfriend pretty quickly there. She did. So once they were an item, they really were an item. They got an apartment together in a suburb of Lansing, splitting it with another friend, but Steve and Tara had their own bedroom. After she graduated in December of 1994, Steve proposed to her right on the steps of the Detroit Museum of Art, which is really a beautiful piece of architecture. So that was something that she really liked, and things were going well, and she said yes. So early in 1995, they moved to the Detroit suburbs, close to where Steve had grown up. When his dad offered him a job with a good salary, he took it because his dad owned like a tool and die shop, I think it was. Yeah, a blue collar worker, but a fairly successful one. Yes, and a family business. Right. Now Tara was unsure at first about moving to Detroit, but Steve persuaded her. He wanted her to overcome her small town way of thinking. And of course, if you said that to her, she would go for it because she did not want to be small town. He appealed to her curiosity for the world outside of the UP he assured her that the area of town they were moving to, about 20 miles north of the city center in the suburbs, was really different from downtown Detroit. So she went along with this idea, and she really appreciated that she was far away from her small town upbringing and was making something of herself. So while Steve's working in the family business, Tara began a job at an engineering firm in Troy, and this firm soon became Washington Group International. Now, she wasn't experienced, but her co-workers noticed her potential. She was very focused and determined. Soon, Tara had moved into a full-time job with increasing responsibilities. She was excited to learn more and establish a corporate career. Yeah, she actually started out there as a Kelly girl, which is like a part-time office girl, and ended up becoming a valuable employee pretty quickly. So Stephen and Tara married in September of 1996. Tara's maid of honor was her sister Alicia. The wedding announcement that ran in the local newspaper stated that Steve had graduated from Michigan State University in 1993, but this wasn't true. He was actually 20 credits short of his bachelor's degree. So here's where we start to see that he was a bit of a fraud. Well, uh, fraud might be too strong a word. I don't know. I think making up a college degree a, a liar. is not good. Same thing, yeah. yeah. Well, and maybe he was planning on finishing school. 
That's possible, but why not just say that he's working on a degree yeah, there or something? Yeah, I know. I guess it sounded better. I don't want to make a big deal out of it, but it's just, um, it's a sign. So after a honeymoon on the Gulf Coast of Alabama, the newlyweds settled into a married life in an Auburn Hills apartment. Tara was already moving up in her job, and she was seen by her employer as a real achiever. In 1997, they were ready to move into their first house. They had saved some money and they needed some more space. They were going to plan a family soon. It didn't take Tara too long to start working her way up in that company, despite taking short breaks because she gave birth to their daughter, Lindsay, in November 2000, and then they had a son, Ian, two years later. Then in 2003, Tara was promoted to a systems manager, and in 2006, she got the offer of a full-time position in Puerto Rico at a salary of $168,000 a year. That's a lot of money for a young person starting a out. A dozen years ago or so. A lot of money now for an older yeah. person, but that's pretty impressive. Now soon she got even more good news. She had been accepted into a prestigious program with the company, geared at those with a real shot at upper management. It was called the LEAP, L-E-A-P program. It was offered each year to just 15 of the company's many employees. So this is big stuff. Yes. And she's, she's moving up rapidly in this company. And, and Steve's not. Steve, well, he's working at the family business. He's more or less a stay-at-home dad. He is. And I will have to say that most people did say that he seemed like a good dad. Yeah, maybe not the best husband. Right, exactly. But seemed to like his kids and spent a lot of time with them. Despite the demands of the job, though, Tara was a very devoted mom. No, she was determined, though, that her kids would be well-rounded and they would feel valued, and they would have a kind of more culture in their lives than she did as a child. So she was really happy when they hired an au pair who was Spanish so that the kids could learn a new language. In 2003, the Grants contracted for their first au pair, and this decision was made so that Steve could work and have some free time without having to haul the kids around to their appointments and whatever else all the time. But the Grants really had a hard time keeping the au pairs. Some stayed for weeks, some for a few months, some got to the U.S. and partied too much, some thought it was just too much work, and the Grants had seven au pairs in all although they still felt this was cheaper than paying for daycare for two kids. The system seemed to work for them, at least for the time being, but there were a couple au pairs who said they left because Steve kind of gave them the creeps. And it could have been just because he was home all the time, that might make you uncomfortable as a young woman, or it could be that he really was creepy, we'll never really know. But when Tara was home, the Grants did seem as close as any family could be, Tara would take Lindsay for manicures while Steve would take Ian and run errands and they would all go out for dinners and she just tried to do a lot of things with the kids when she was there. Yeah, and we might mention that she wasn't there that much. No, her, she was gone at least three to four days a week. Her job in Puerto Rico required her presence there, not at home. Right. So she would typically fly out Monday or Tuesday, fly back Friday and have a couple days, maybe three days at home. With the family. Yes, exactly. So that was, that was kind of tough. Well, yes. There were a lot of problems with that. Yeah. So Tara started taking golf lessons. A Which lot was of, more time away from the family, unfortunately. Right. But a lot of business got done on the golf course. And with her about to begin the LEAP program, she thought it was wise to know how to golf. So she's looking ahead. She was such a planner. She would also meticulously plan family events in a notebook and compile lengthy gifts of gifts, and would compile lengthy lists of gifts to give her children at birthdays and Christmases. Perhaps she was compensating for her long hours away from them. Well, and that happens. I feel like if you're not around a lot, you do want to buy more stuff for your kids. That just happens. And I think when she wasn't home, she wanted to have cards for them, like she had um, a drawer full of cards that she would leave for them and write things for them. So she was trying to stay in their lives even when she wasn't there. But she was also pretty generous with Stephen. In 2007, 
Even though it was just February, she was already planning a special surprise for him. It was a combination birthday and Christmas present for him that coming December, which was a trip to the Napa Valley, where Stephen could indulge in expensive wines, which was something that he liked. And he, she thought it would kind of be a romantic thing for them to enjoy staying in some hotels together. It was kind of going to be like a second honeymoon. Yeah, it sounds like a good trip. Yeah. So in 2006, Stephen made $18,900 working at his dad's machine shop. Now, this was less than Tara's year-end bonus of $28,000. So there's a significant financial difference in these two. Which didn't have to be a problem necessarily, because it happens all the time, vice oh, versa. Sure. But, but I think he had a hard time dealing with that. Yeah, the, the differences are certainly straining the marriage. And maybe Tara thought that the trip to, the, to Napa might bring them closer together. Oh, I'm sure she did. So their current au pair was a 19-year-old German lady named Verena. She was blonde and beautiful. Now, she was taking Spanish lessons at a local college, had become friends with some other au pairs in the area, and seemed quite committed to the Grant family. It's easy to see how Stephen Grant could be attracted to her. In fact, some of Tara's friends wondered why Tara would leave her husband alone for days at a time with someone like Verena. Well, it's true. I mean, you should be able to trust your spouse with anyone, but that just seems like a, a bad idea in general. Why even make that a possibility? Well, we could talk about that for quite some time, couldn't we? We could. But, you know, it is up to Steve to be faithful to his wife, no matter what the circumstances are. So well, I wouldn't want to make an excuse for him in this. That's what I was going to say. Okay, good. I agree. Okay. But still, I don't think I would do that. I would just avoid that. So early February 2007... Steve was really escalating his flirting with Verena, and it did become a physical relationship. He started out kissing her, and then he began going into her bedroom and just kind of flirting with her and asking her to have sex with him. On February 8th, that was the night before Tara returned home from Puerto Rico, he gave her oral sex, and they slept together on the night that Tara was murdered. Verena didn't know about this at the time, and she was really upset when she found out. But she would return to Germany before Stephen was arrested. Tara had written a long letter to Stephen around that time, apologizing for always making him feel like he was wrong, for not loving him as well as she should, and for sometimes pushing him away. She wrote that she wanted them to renew their wedding vows. Now this would have been a good letter to possibly give him on Valentine's Day, so maybe she was going to polish it up and put it in Valentine's card, we'll never know. Because it was still in her notebook when she flew to San Juan on February 5th, and still there when she arrived back home on February 9th. So a little before noon on Valentine's Day, 2007, Stephen walked into the Macomb County Sheriff's Department and went to the plexiglass window just inside the lobby. He told the desk sergeant that he wanted to report his wife was missing. The sergeant told one of the deputies working the front desk with him to go get Bill Hughes, who was a 20-year veteran of the department. Now, Hughes didn't start working until 10. He opened the door to the lobby and invited Stephen Grant into his office. The report would tell the facts, which were dry in the manner of police reports everywhere. But what was happening in Hughes's office was interesting and concerning. So Stephen was rambling on pretty quickly about his wife's disappearance. He said Tara had been late getting home the night of the 9th due to a snowstorm. He'd had a couple of beers while he waited for her. They had argued over the phone about a change in her travel plans. She was planning to go back to Puerto Rico on Sunday instead of Monday. So he's all bent out of shape. You just get home Friday, you're leaving Sunday. I miss you, the kids miss you, the usual. Well, let's just remember here that this is Steve's version. Mm-hmm. Just putting that in your mind. And the fight had actually resumed when she got home. Yes. Well, he was pissed off when she got home because he said, hello, honey, or something, and she had her earbuds in listening to music, and she didn't immediately respond. According to Steve again. I'm just taking the <laughs> Steve side, you know? Okay, I know, I know. 
I just feel like I have to throw that in once in a while. So they yelled back and forth for about 20 minutes. And then Tara had made a call on her cell, told someone to pick her up, and said she'd be out in a minute. Now, Grant didn't know for sure, but he thought it was the limo service she frequently used to get to the airport. The last thing she said to him on her way out was, don't forget to get the car to the dealership Monday to get a dent fixed. Verena, the au pair, got home about 10 minutes after Tara left, according to Steve. Yeah, so Hughes asked the obvious question. If Tara went missing on the 9th, why is he just coming in on the 14th to report her missing? So Steve said that her boss asked him to wait. He left messages on Tara's cell phone both Saturday and Sunday, and when he didn't hear from her by Monday, he said he'd called her boss, Lou Trundle, in Puerto Rico. Trundle asked him to hold off a bit with the police. He wanted to have a meeting with her bosses in Puerto Rico to discuss it first. Now, Hughes didn't follow the logic of that, but, you know, he knows the ropes. He's letting Stephen continue his story. You know, you got to let him talk. So Hughes was jotting down notes as Stephen kept looking at a notebook that he had, kind of referring to notes he'd made, I guess, which is strange to me. He said that Tuesday he'd called Tara's sister and her mom, and both said they hadn't heard from Tara either. Stephen said he told Tara's sister that he'd be happy to find out if Tara was off with some guy in a hotel somewhere. He just wanted her to be okay. He thought, he confided to Hughes, that Lou Trundle and Tara's mom were lying to him. In fact, Tara's family had voiced some worries in the past that Tara and Lou were having an affair. Now, Steve said he didn't believe it at first, but lately he'd been getting suspicious that maybe it was true. Stephen said he'd been talking to his dad and that his dad had told him the first person police always suspect in these things is the husband. Now, Hughes read this as Stephen trying to seem cool and unworried about the fact that he would be investigated. He had, he told Hughes, a warrant out for his arrest for an unpaid traffic ticket. Hughes figured that this was Grant telling him, I'm open and honest with you. I'm telling you my secrets. So Hughes let that go. Now, detectives were going to want to talk to him soon, so there was no point in putting Steve on the defensive or arresting him at this point. And Stephen was really open about talking, which, of course, the detective loved that. Stephen said that they'd been to marriage counseling, but it wasn't helping, and that he was thinking of hiring a divorce lawyer. So the red flags are just popping up left and right here, I'm sure. Yeah, this guy, the policeman Hughes, (laughs) is already thinking something's not right with this story. Exactly. Which would certainly place Stephen as a suspect. Yeah. And Stephen added that Tara's company, Washington Group International, was involved in chemical weapons, and Lou was in charge of that project. So he suggested that maybe Tara had been exposed to nerve gas. Maybe she'd been kidnapped by terrorists. Now Hughes at this point just stared at him, trying not to let on how weird this conversation was getting. Totally weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really. And if you see pictures of Stephen, you can see how he could look a little wacko. (laughs) He really could get the bulgy eyes and not look real normal. Right, so Hughes suggested that they give Lou, the boss, a call. Stephen gave him the number, and he made the call with Stephen sitting there, thinking it could be interesting to see how he reacted to that. Lou Trundle struck Hughes as genuinely concerned. He offered to help in any way he could. Now, he was sure that there was no way Tara would ever take off on her own. She wouldn't leave her kids, and she wouldn't just not show up for work. So when he got off the phone with Trundle, Stephen asked Hughes if he wanted to call Tara's parents now. Hughes said no. Then Stephen brought up the au pair again. Hughes wondered why. Hughes asked him if he was having some kind of relationship with her. She'll never tell, Stephen said, giving Hughes a smirk like he was making a joke. Creepy. <laughs> More than Jesus. So Hughes didn't think this was very funny. Strange. Nobody did. Well, no, not under these circumstances. No. Now, he had a feeling, Hughes had a feeling that Stephen wasn't joking. But anyway, it was a pretty inappropriate thing to say when you're reporting your wife missing. Isn't it, though? Let's take a minute here, Dick, to mention our sponsors. Okay. Today's show is sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. 
When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, you deserve real protection from ADT. Now for me, real protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is standing by and is there for you when you need them. Real protection means having a safe and smart home with everything from video doorbells, surveillance cameras, smart locks, lights, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors in a system that's custom designed to fit your lifestyle. And setting up custom automations to do things like lock the doors and set the thermostat when you leave. Real protection means staying safe on the go, in the car or when your kids are at school, with the ADT Go app and SOS button. Real protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. Real protection also means direct connections with first responders. There are really enough unknowns in life, so why not let ADT make home security a sure thing? No matter how you define safety for you, your family, or your business, ADT is there. ADT. Real protection. Visit ADT.com slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. This year, you can make health and wellness a top priority with the help of Care Of's monthly subscription vitamin service. Simply answer a few questions about your diet, health goals, and lifestyle choices via Care Of's fun online quiz. And you'll get personal scientifically backed vitamin and supplement recommendations in only five minutes. Then each month, Care Of delivers them right to your door in customized daily packs. Really great for an on-the-go lifestyle. There are even vegan and vegetarian supplement options available to match your dietary needs. I love that because it's not always easy to find vitamins for we vegan folks. The quiz also was easy and fun. It took me about two minutes, but it got right to the point, so I ended up with just what I needed. Plus, I have to tell you, I'm actually in love with the individual packets. They're small, and they come in an easy-to-dispense box that I keep on the kitchen counter, I keep it right by the coffee maker so I can't forget them in the morning. For me, a woman of a certain age on a plant-based diet, taking my vitamins is important. I need my B12, my D, and my calcium to keep my bones strong and my energy up. We all have our individual needs, and Care Of helps us take care of them. So take advantage of this month's special New Year's offer. For 50% off your first month of personalized Care Of vitamins, go to TakeCareOf.com and enter promo code BREWERY50. That's TakeCareOf.com and code BREWERY50. You'll get 50% off the first month. So Hughes finishes the interview with Stephen, and he asked him to write out a statement of events. This statement was three pages long. I'll give you a few highlights. Okay. So Friday, February 9th at about 6 p.m., I spoke to my wife while she was delayed in Newark. Tara told me she was delayed for about an hour, hour and a half. She told me she was changing travel plans to fly back to San Juan on Sunday the 11th instead of Monday the 12th. I told her I was not happy with this, and we argued a bit about her travel schedule in general. I said it was not fair to the kids that they would only see her for one day. She said, tough. She arrived in Detroit. We talked three more times while she was driving home. Yeah, and then he wrote after Tara got home that they continued the argument, and she told him she was going back to Puerto Rico the next morning if she could get a flight. She also said that he could explain to the kids why she wasn't there in the morning, and he saw her leave in a black sedan. He said there was no contact on Saturday or Sunday. He said he had phoned and left messages on her mobile phone, and that he got no response from her. He called Lou Trendle in Puerto Rico on Monday. Now, according to him, Lou said no worries. Tara wasn't due until later. He said he would tell her to call and let him know when she was there. He wrote that Lou called at 9.30 in the morning on Tuesday, 13th February, saying he had not heard from Tara. She didn't show up in the Puerto Rico office. He then called her mother, Mary, who, he wrote, told him not to call police. She would send a message to Tara and have her call. He told Mary, 
If he heard nothing by 4 p.m. Tuesday, the 13th, he was going to the police. He talked with his sister, who is friends with a Sterling Heights detective, and she called him to ask what was the rule for reporting someone missing. Detective Jim Saluski told her that I should wait until Wednesday the 14th in the morning to report her missing. So the police generally don't take missing person reports too seriously. But with this case, they made an exception. Now, at one thirty that afternoon, two detectives were assigned to the case, Darga and Kozlowski. They divided up a list of people to call, Tara's family, her boss, her co-workers, limo companies with contracts with the airport, other taxi services. Detective Darga called Alicia Standifer, Tara's sister's husband, Eric, to get a feel for how the family was taking her disappearance. Eric was emphatic that Tara would under no circumstances disappear for five days. She did travel a lot, but she kept in touch daily with her family. And Hughes finished a supplemental report that he gave to Detective Kozlowski. The supplemental report contained a little more detail than the first report, most notably the mention of a scratch on Stephen Grant's nose. I noticed a red scratch on the bridge of Stephen's nose on the right side, Hughes wrote. I asked Stephen, did he get into a fight with Tara on the night she left? Stephen said no. Hughes wrote that Stephen told him he told Tara during their argument that the kids would be disappointed if she went right back to Puerto Rico, but also told him his two kids wouldn't miss their mother because he was the one who was involved in their soccer. And he wasn't sure at this point if he even wanted Tara back. The report said Stephen told Hughes that while members of his immediate family thought Tara was having an affair with her boss, Lou, he didn't. He said he had called Tara's sister in Ohio to see if she'd heard anything, that he'd told the sister that he was worried, and that he'd even see it as good news if he found out that Tara was in a motel somewhere with her boyfriend. He goes back and forth here, doesn't he? Old Steve. He sure does. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't think she's having an affair with her boss, but I hope she's somewhere with a boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't really have his story very straight, does he? I, I think he didn't have enough time to concoct a good story. He had four or five days. Well, but the old pair came home shortly after he'd murdered her. Yeah, and then he was busy with her for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he didn't have enough time to really get a good story going. No. So Detective Kaz, as his colleagues called him, phoned Stephen Grant. He kept a friendly tone and told, St and told Stephen he was on the case and wanted to come out and meet him. Kaz then called Lou Trundle. There had been no plans for Tara to return to Puerto Rico early on Sunday, he said. He'd worked with Tara for 10 years, knew her, and said it was impossible to believe she'd take off on her own. In 10 years with the company, she hadn't missed even a day of work. And Trundle was very worried. Washington Group's, sec Washington Group's security chief, Joe Herity, had checked out Tara's company cell phone records, her email, and the company credit card. And guess what? There was no activity on any of those since February 9th, the day she returned home. Now, I don't even think I can say how ominous that is. I mean, that is a very ominous sign. People don't disappear yeah, and not use any she's, she's, credit card or she's anything. She's been vaporized. There's yeah. Nothing at all. I mean, that's a pretty sure sign that she's been killed, in my opinion. Yep. Her sister, Alicia, told them that Stephen had called her at home the night before when she wasn't in and he'd left a message. And he said it was no big deal just to give him a call. So this was strange. How could he say it was no big deal? Now, she also told the police that she had talked to Tara the night that she went missing, the night, and Tara had called her from the Newark airport during her weather delay. She said they talked for about 40 minutes. Tara had not mentioned anything about a change of plans, about returning early to Puerto Rico. She had said she was going back as usual on Monday. So Stephen called Detective Kaz at 3 p.m., wanting to know how the investigation was going and Kaz said that he would come by that evening to talk to him again. So Kaz arrived at the house with Sergeant Pam McLean around 5 p.m. Stephen let them in, introduced them to the children, 
and the au pair Verena, and the first thing that Stephen said after introducing them was, do you have a guy on my house? And Kaz said, sure, we can't be too careful. You know, a guy on my house meaning is someone watching him. Right. And someone was. So while Kaz talked to Stephen in the kitchen, Pam McLean talked to Verena alone in the living room. And Verena was obviously nervous, but who wouldn't be, right? So Pam McLean asked her to go over what happened on February 9th. Verena said she was out partying with friends and came home to find that the children were in bed and Stephen was alone. She told McLean that she thought it was really unusual that Tara would have left her kids like that, and that she also thought it was odd that Tara would have called a service to take her to the airport, because she always drove herself. So this is a direct contradiction to what Stephen said. He made it sound like she always used a car service. He certainly did. Now, meanwhile, Kaz is talking to Stephen, and he asked him about the scratch on his nose. Stephen said a metal shaving at work got caught under his safety goggles. He showed Kaz a scratch on his hand, too, and he showed Kaz a bruise and a scratch on one of his legs. Kind of like, is this the way a guilty man would act? Trying to seem, like, really helpful. And the detective wasn't buying that for a minute. He thought it was all an act. Then Kaz asked if either Stephen or his wife had been having an affair. And Steve said he'd been faithful. Tara had strayed once, he said, but her affair was over, and she had been faithful now, too. Then the detectives asked to look through the house. So they're, they're just there to gather information. There's no search warrant or anything at this point. No. So Stephen agreed, and in the master bedroom, they found a loaded handgun with two loaded magazines in a black case and a roll of duct tape. Stephen said he'd left it there a while back and had forgot to put it away. They also found a red photo journal. It was photos of the au pair and her friend. It was Verena's. So the unasked question was, why was it in his and Tara's bedroom and not in Verena's room? Well, that's super suspicious, isn't it? I mean, that makes you think she's been hanging out in the master bedroom with him. Yeah. What else are you going to think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> In Tara's closet, which was a walk-in that had a closet organizer to fit in all her business suits, regular clothes and shoes was full. So there weren't any gaps like you'd expect if she'd packed and left in a huff. Yeah, all her clothes seemed to be there. Now her suitcase was there, but he had claimed that she'd packed a new suitcase or a different suitcase and taken it. The sheriff's department made up a missing persons flyer. It had a photo of Tara that Stephen had left with police when he'd come in the day before. Now, that same day, they received a fax from Stephen Grant's new attorney, David Green. This was a well-known, expensive attorney. The fax read that Stephen would continue to answer all of their questions in the future, but the attorney believed it was necessary, just so there were no misunderstandings, that all of their future questions be submitted in writing. Now, this really clinched it for these detectives and convinced them that he had killed his wife. They're trying to find his missing wife, and it's only been 24 hours after he came to the police for help. And he's gone out and hired one of the highest paid attorneys in town, telling them they can't talk to him in person. So getting this fax was a real surprise. But that it was from Grimm, who they all knew of, really clinched it. They didn't think that someone would spend that kind of money on an attorney if they were innocent. So that morning, Grimm had returned Stephen's call and told him to come see him immediately, and it was in front of Stephen that he typed up this note to the police and faxed it over. So on the way home from Grimm's, Granite called Verena. She was in the garage and started crying. She said two policemen had come by looking for him. They were parked at the end of the street, she said. Stephen called Grimm. Grimm told him they didn't have probable cause to arrest him, but might be looking to execute a search warrant. Stephen drove to his father's shop, hung out there for a while, talked to his sister on the phone, and then decided to head home. So on his way home, just a block from the sheriff's department, he heard a siren and saw flashers in his rearview mirror, and he pulled over. 
So Detective Kaz knew that Stephen had a warrant out for his arrest for all those unpaid traffic tickets. So they had a car behind him and a patrol car parked up the road ahead of him. Well, yeah, but it was really interesting that uh, he had paid off all of the tickets but one, like he'd purposely left one. So it would be something to confide to the detective. When the police pulled him over, they said that he had made a turn without signaling. And he may have, we don't know. But he had this one traffic ticket that was unpaid, so there was still a warrant in place. It couldn't have been that he'd forgotten about one, because he'd mentioned it to Hughes. I think the only explanation here would be that he wanted to be able to admit it when he reported Tara missing, just as a way to show how honest and forthcoming he was, because he was doing a lot of that. A lot of trying to look innocent. He's he's trying his best to be the bereaved innocent husband. And he's a little clever about it in some ways. Not clever enough, but he did show a little bit of, you know, intelligence there. A little bit. (laughs) Not a lot. But in a search of his car, they found an envelope with $1,100 in cash and another with over $1,900 in cash. So Stephen was arrested and taken to the jail where he spent six hours, and then he was released on bail. Yeah, and over the next several days, the case dominated local news, and Green complained to the media about the arrest. He said, three police cars surrounded my client's car as he was driving home and arrested him over an unpaid traffic ticket for driving 55 miles per hour in a 45-mile-per-hour zone. Then they incarcerated him for six and a half hours and questioned him. Those are Neanderthal tactics and demonstrate bad faith on the part of the police. Well, the police asked Grant to take a polygraph, but Green turned them down. According to Green, there's a built-in bias by police to interpret results to a client's disadvantage. So he scheduled a polygraph for him for February 16th with a former Oakland County Sheriff's deputy who he often used. But Stephen canceled that one. He claimed that something had come up with the kids. But as soon as he did that, Green said, you're throwing your life away. And so Stephen gave in and took it. But Green never released the results. So we could take that to mean that maybe he didn't do that well. We could. So Stephen had told police that Tara changed her plans and decided to go back to Puerto Rico a day early. But airline records showed that she had not taken a flight anywhere. And she had kept the same booking for that Monday, just didn't use it. Her cell phone records didn't show any calls to anyone she worked with that weekend. So she would have called someone about a change in plans to let them, let them know she'd be back early. And the records didn't show any calls since then, since the 9th. Stephen said Tara left in a black sedan after making a call to be picked up. But her records didn't show any calls around the time she would have had to have made that call. Her last call had been an 18-minute call to her husband at 9.47 p.m., the day she returned home. So that's also very ominous. Yes, it is. That does not bode well for her well-being. Eventually, they found out that in the last year of weekly travel, Tara had only used a car service once. On every other trip, she drove herself. Credit card records would normally take a while to get access for the police, but Tara only used a company credit card. And the Washington group was worried about her and monitored the use and was happy to share it with police. Nothing had been charged since 9.32, the night that she arrived at the airport when she used it to pay to get her car out of the parking lot and drive home. So what did Steve Grant's cell phone records show? Those were interesting. Yeah, around the call he got from Tara, there were four calls to Verena, the au pair starting at 9.08 and ending at 10.32. Now, Tara's phone had since gone dead, and so had her computer. Then on Saturday, Steve called Tara's cell six times with no response. Thanks to data storage, detectives were able to get transcripts. From their point of view, Stephen's messages were just an act. But if Tara had in fact taken off and was still alive, his messages would be just what you'd expect from a concerned husband. Right, so it does show that he was kind of clever about it. So for example, at 2.17 a.m., he said, Tara, it's Steve, it's after two by now, 
It's quarter after two, and I want to know what the fuck's going on. Um, I think you owe me and your kids at least, at the very least, a call. Call me. Um, bye. Just call and let me know what the hell's going on. Then later that morning at almost 9.30, Hey, it's me. I'm just trying to find out what's going on this morning. And uh, if you're still leaving today, if you're leaving tomorrow, um, what's going on? And if you're planning on coming by, just tell me ahead of time so I can make plans. Make sure the kids are here because they want to see you. Give me a call. Bye. Then at almost noon later that morning, Hey, I get that you're pissed at me. I just left the house. I have to go to the bank for my dad. Verena's at the house with the kids. Please at least call your kids. It's ridiculous, Tara. It's not right. Just call, please, so I can talk to you. They didn't get to see you last night. Then at 6 p.m., it's me. You need to call us. Just let us know what's going on. The kids and I would like to talk to you, please. I just don't know what the deal is, so call me. We're here. I'm just ordering pizza for dinner, so we'll be here. I'm just going to have it delivered, I think, so call us. Bye. So these seem like pretty normal messages you would leave for your spouse yeah, in that on, situation. Yeah, on the face of it, they are pretty con you know, normal messages or things that you think would be sent. Yeah, they're not yeah. all flowery. Like, remember the message that Scott Peterson left for Lacey when he knew she was dead? Yeah. It was obviously flowery and fake. So these are a little more of what you would expect. Yeah, except that the police already know different stories. Sure. So, but yeah. anyway. So Stephen called once more Monday and once on Tuesday, but he never called Tara on Wednesday the 14th, which is the day that he reported her missing. Hmm. So wouldn't you think he'd have left a message or two warning her that if he didn't hear from her, he's going to the police that day? Yeah. Or a message later saying that he'd reported her missing and was now a police investigation? I would think so. I think you'd say, hey, I'm going to the police today. You better call and say something. Well, yeah. I mean, if we're you're, really worried. you're looking at the pattern of calls and then to suddenly go silent when, when he does report her missing. Yeah, that doesn't seem right. That's suspicious. On the last day of Tara's life, she woke up around 6.30 a.m. in Puerto Rico. She made a couple of calls as she got ready to board her plane home, which departed at 1 p.m. with the connecting flight in Newark. When she landed in Newark, she spoke with a friend named Kirby Lloyd. At 6 p.m. as she waited for a connecting flight to Detroit, she called her sister Alicia, and they chatted for 41 minutes. During that chat, Alicia would say that Tara and she said she and Steve were on different paths. Tara spoke with Steve intermittently during that day, and according to Steve, the two discussed her travel schedule with Steve urging her to see if she could lighten it up a bit. While most people really could see no flaws in the Grant marriage, others were beginning to see that Tara's success was really creating some animosity with Steve, and Tara was beginning to feel that they were really growing apart. So her flight to Detroit was delayed, but by 7 p.m. she was in her seat and ready to go home. The plane landed in Detroit around 9 p.m., she pulled out of the parking garage at 9.30 and called Steve at home. Now they were bickering again, according to Steve. They spoke for 18 minutes, beginning at 9.47, as she was making the hour-long drive back to their home. So it was near 10.30 when she pulled into the driveway and pulled her truck into the garage and shut the door. Tara, despite always giving the impression to others that things were going great, may have been ready to give her husband some kind of ultimatum. So it's possible that Tara walked into the house on February 9th, determined to have a serious talk about the marriage. But Steve would later say that she did not come in wanting to continue the argument, but she had her earbuds in and her iPod playing, that she had her laptop case over her shoulder. He said that the disagreement between them was about cutting back her travel schedule. Of course, Tara can't give her side of what happened that night. So there's only Steve's story and whatever evidence the police have found to go by. Steve mentioned to detectives more than once that he was riding his bike at a park nearby. This was Stony Creek Park. And he also mentioned that he and Tara had spent a lot of time there together. So this seemed to detectives as if it might be a significant place. 
so eight days after Tara's disappearance, a search of the park was planned. On Saturday, February 24th, police and volunteers gathered before dawn, not far from Stony Creek's Nature Center, close to the park trails that Steve was known to use regularly, to start their search. Because if someone wanted to hide a body, that seemed like the most obvious way you would do it there. Because you wouldn't have to enter the park in your car or pass the entrance booth, which had a person working in it. You could just pull up to the edge and you could carry or drag the body just a few yards and you would still be on trails. So if Grant had killed Tara and decided to dump her body this close to home, it would have been at that park they felt. Both Steve and Tara had run there regularly. It was close to their home. It was also deeply wooded and it had some swamps and boggy areas. Yeah, so they were looking for Tara, but they were looking for evidence of her too. Maybe a cell phone, a purse, clothing. Because there were more than 4,000 acres and many miles of trails in the park, and it was going to take weeks to properly search the entire park. Now, during this time, Stephen is making the rounds of the media, crying for the return of his wife on morning shows and cable news shows. He was courting the press, and he, it seemed, couldn't get enough of the attention. He did like being on TV. He seemed to, yeah. On Monday, February 26th, police opened a hotline, 800-690-FIND, and a website was set up for tips. Tara's information was entered into the National Center for Missing Adults database. So around 1 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday, February 28th, a local 34-year-old woman went out for a walk along the, shoulder, along the shoulder of Mount Vernon Road. She walked east into the woods and into a quiet corner of Stony Creek Metro Park. Just a few yards in, barely off the road, she saw a large gallon-sized Ziploc bag squished between some fallen, some fallen tree branches. Now there's some red material inside it which really stood out in the snow. Any Everyone who lived anywhere near the park had been aware of the search on Saturday. So she reached down, picked it up, and what looked like blood pooled at the bottom. Inside the bag were other plastic bags with a pair of latex gloves, gloves and what looked to be metal shavings. She turned around, walked home, and went inside to call the police. Officer John Warren followed up visiting her house. It looked like blood to him, too. So he followed the woman to her car, and she took him to where she found the bag. Then he called Kaz, who told him he was sending a deputy named Ron Murphy, who was an evidence tech, to meet him. Murphy tested a spotted piece of the plastic with McPhail's reagent. So if the object, if the object is blood, this reagent turns a bluish green, and it did. Murphy took pictures of the scene as well, and he found a set of deteriorating footprints that headed away from the fallen branches and into the woods. And there was blood, but that didn't mean it was human blood. So this was sent to the state police crime lab in Sterling Heights to determine, was this animal blood or human blood? Another thing that was there were a few strands of long, light-colored hair in the bag. Could have been human or not but the police thought immediately of the Grant's dog, who had longish, light-colored hair. There was a very lengthy backlog of tests to be done at the state's crime labs, but because of the notoriety of this case, the lab went, white. The lab went right to work. The blood in the bag was human. The bag had four clear plastic garbage bags, one pair of latex gloves, one 7-Eleven bag, and another Ziploc bag and all of them had human blood on them. And then there were the metal shavings. Now the police were certain that they had probable cause for a search warrant. Because remember, metal shavings. Grant worked at a tool and die shop. Right. So, I mean, they, they found the bag near the home. There were metal shavings similar to what would be found in the kind of shop where Steve worked. It also had what looked like dog hair in it, matching their dog. There was human blood, his wife was missing, and Steve had visible cuts on his nose and hand the day he reported her missing. There's a lot of clues there. So they finally got their search warrant. 
They did. A group went to Steve's dad's shop, and another group went to the Grant house. No one was at the shop, so they broke down the door with a battering ram. The place was dark, dirty, and cluttered. There were several metal lathes and drill presses, a sandblaster, and a bandsaw. Tools had been left out, and there was litter on the, mach on the machines and a coating of metal dust almost everywhere, except for a large clean patch on the floor, which stood out to them. They saw what looked like a couple drops of blood on the floor in a doorway and under the door handle, and they took photos of them. Yeah, you know, just as the first officers showed up at the Grant house to begin their search, the surveillance team notified them that Stephen Grant had just left his sister's house and he appeared to be heading back to the house, back home. A cruiser stood by to stop Steve before he could pull into his subdivision because they didn't want him to see all the activity. Someone had leaked and reporters were outside of the house in addition to the police. So Steve was pulled over and he was cooperative. The deputy told him about the search and that he would need to keep out of the way. And they also took his driver's license away. And the police would say that he acted pretty normal. Once he was inside his home, he did call his attorney, but he wasn't under arrest. He said that he needed to take the dog for a walk, so he put the leash on the dog and he went outside. Then he walked down his driveway. The media surrounded him and photographers took his picture and video. So people watching TV saw Steve Grant walking into the distance and actually disappearing into the dark. Boom, he's gone. Yeah. So Detective Mark Gramatico was standing in the Grant's garage with several other detectives as evidence techs were working in the house. Gramatico had been there all along with most everyone else for the last hour and a half or so. Around 6.30, he and the other officers were freezing and they wanted to get going. But their attention soon turned to the other side of the room, where Detective Sergeant Brian Kozlowski had been poking around. He called out suddenly, What the fuck? Detective Kozlowski had noticed a container he hadn't seen during his previous visits. When the detective had looked over the garage during his visit on the night Tara had been reported missing, he'd noticed some plastic storage containers. But this one hadn't been there. It sat under a black mesh tarp. The container was dark green and had a blue snap on top and red handles. So he pulled the tarp away, unsnapped the handles, and found a pile of black plastic bags stacked on top of each other. The top bag was dusty. It was soft to the touch, and it gave in to pressure. He began to tear the black bags away, and as he tugged and tore deeper into the bags, he came across one that was clear and smeared with what looked like blood. He used his flashlight to get a better look and thought it was a deer carcass. But then he saw clothing and a woman's bra. So the mystery where Tara was had been solved. A large piece of her body had been found, partially frozen, in the garage. So what they found was her torso, mm. with no head, no arms, no legs. This was shocking even to the experienced detectives, I of course. I can imagine. We seem to be in a dismemberment of bodies these last few cases. Do we? We've had a few. Okay. I don't remember any very recently, but we have had a few. We have. But this is really a gruesome story. Oh, this is horrible. I mean, her headless torso was on its back in the container, severed at the top of her thighs. Her top was still dressed in her gray Ann Taylor blouse that Steve had described that she was wearing the last time he saw her on February 9th, and it was torn open. The police officers moved to look into the container, and they had to hold down some dry heaves. It was pretty upsetting and disgusting. Now, it was cold out, so it didn't smell at least. But obviously this wasn't what they were hoping to find. They did feel that Steve had probably killed her, but I think they were holding out hope that he hadn't. Well, sure. So the container was dusted for prints and moved to go to the coroner's, to the county medical examiner's office. It was then that the officers all looked at each other and asked the big question, where was Steve? He's their suspect and he had just quietly left his house about an hour ago. Yeah. So he has a big head start. I got to go walk the dog. Boom. I'm really surprised no one followed him. If they'd been yeah. thinking, they probably should have. Well, I mean, the, the big excuse was that at the time, 
he wasn't a suspect. Well, maybe not officially, but he definitely was. Yeah, well, they're, they're just backtracking to try to disperse some of the blame. They yeah. absolutely should have had someone keeping an eye on him. It was a mistake. He sure. should have been parked in the back of a police car while they searched the house. Well, I don't know if they could detain him because he wasn't under arrest, but they definitely could have watched him. Well, they, they could invite him to sit in the car. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the APB went out immediately to state police and other jurisdictions. Stephen was missing and wanted in connection with the murder of Tara Grant, his wife of 10 years. He apparently had killed his wife, cut her into pieces, and tried to hide her body in his garage. So this so-called Mr. Mom and dedicated family man had committed a grisly murder, and he was on the run. Yeah, after he left the house to supposedly walk the dog, he dialed up his friend Mike Zanlugo. Tara and Steve were good friends with Mike and his wife, who lived a couple of miles away in another subdivision. So Steve asked Mike to pick him up at a crossroad in his subdivision. They drove to Mike's house, where Steve let Mike out and borrowed his truck. Then Steve called his sister Kelly's cell phone to let her know he was coming by, and she told him that she and her husband Chris were at church with his kids for the Friday fish fry. Steve headed over to the church. Now it's dark and cold. This is a winter evening. So even in the heated truck cab, he's not very warm. He wasn't wearing a winter coat. Kelly met Steve in the church hallway, and she noticed that he was really in full panic mode. He talked to his kids for a minute, and then he asked to borrow his sister's house key so he could drop his dog off at her house. The dog, he said, would only get in the way at the house on Westridge where they were doing the search. He also confided to Kelly, I'm going to get arrested. The deputy told me that if they find one drop of blood in the house, I will go to prison. And this was shocking to Kelly. She didn't believe that her little brother could be a murderer. He had had previous arrests for driving with a suspended driver's license, and he had quite a few childhood misdeeds. But Kelly had never thought of her brother Steve as a killer. So Steve drove to Kelly's house with a plan to commit suicide. He looked for the 38 handgun that he knew they had, but he couldn't find it. The medicine cabinet had an almost full bottle of Vicodin, which is a narcotic pain medicine. So he took those pills and he left. And after leaving Kelly's, he drove toward Lansing. So he drank whiskey and took Vicodin as he drove along until he was heavily under the influence. He stopped at a Meyer store on Lake Lansing Road in East Lansing. Then he went to another in the suburbs. He bought some razor blades and a bottle of Tylenol PM, a notebook, some calling cards, a temporary use cell phone, and a black magic marker, also a plastic cap gun. He had this idea that if the police pulled him over, he could pull out this cap gun, and then he would get shot. It would be a suicide by cop. So the marker was to color over the little red dot on the end of the cap gun so it would look more like a real gun. He jumped back in the truck and he drove north, taking back roads. He stopped at an ATM and withdrew $500. At a convenience store, he bought more whiskey and a quart of Bailey's Irish cream, and he drank from each bottle. Now he called his sister to check on the kids, and then he made two calls to Verena, who was already in Germany. Back at the Grant house, evidence technicians were searching the house, but they hadn't found much. There were some tiny drops of dried blood on the floor in the family room by the fireplace. There was a blood stain in the basement wine cellar, but there was nothing alarming. Some blood is common in most houses just from everyday life, scrapes and scratches. And this house was very clean. Officers took some electronic items, including a desktop computer, some thumb drives, a digital camera, a webcam, and a laptop. They also found a 9mm pistol. So I'm surprised Steve didn't try and take that gun with him when he left. Well, I guess he didn't want to be too obvious. Yeah, they might have noticed that. Yeah. So at 1.30 in the morning, Steve called his attorney. There was silence on the line, and, and Green could hear Steve crying. Steve said he wanted to die. Now, Green tried to, tried to talk him down, saying he would defend him in court, and his children needed him. According to Green, Steve's hurt quickly turned into anger. 
She treated us like shit, he told Grimm. It's her fault this happened. Everyone hates me, but it's her fault. She cheated on me. She left us alone. We meant nothing to her. Then he began to cry again. Tell my kids that I love them. I tried to be a good dad. I did. I love them so damn much. And he hung up. So it almost seems like he's feeling sorry for himself at that point. Yep. Well, Green would later say that he had actually decided to drop Steve Grant as a client one day earlier. And he said that was based on learning that Steve had been involved with the teenage au pair, Verena. And that made him want to drop the case. Although I kind of wonder if he failed the polygraph and that was part of it as well. But well, it could be. I mean, like you said, this is a pretty uh, high-powered attorney. Yeah. And he didn't want to take a losing case. Well, that's true. But at this point, with Steve on the run, he did feel like it was his duty to be there for him. So two hours passed, and Green's phone rang again. And this time, Steve was drunker, angrier, and he was really ranting. In the middle of a rant about his children and the problems in his marriage, Steve said it was an accident. So that was kind of an aha moment for the attorney. Mm -hmm. Steve seemed even more certain that the only answer at this point was to end his life. His children's mother was dead, and now their father was going to end his life. So the kids would be orphans. So Green decided that at this point, he really had no choice but to call the police so they could bring Steve in before he killed himself. Now, at one point, Steve stopped the car and called Verena again. And this was a short conversation. But Verena later told police that Steve had told her he and Tara had argued and she hit him. And in response, he'd pushed her and she'd fallen and died. He apologized to her for lying. And after hanging up with her, he pulled the truck into, onto the shoulder of the road and called his sister Kelly again. He told her to let the kids know that he loved them. He told her where he was, outside Wilderness State Park. He said he was going to kill himself. Then he moved on into the park. Kelly just walked outside of her house, because there were officers parked out there watching her house, and told, told them that she knew where Steve was. Steve just called me, and he's in Wilderness State Park, and he said he's going to kill himself. So Steve had been walking in the darkness for about an hour when he heard a helicopter moving closer with searchlights flashing on the snow. Searchers found some things that he had left behind him. He'd left the cap gun, a notebook, and a pint of whiskey that was about a quarter full. He was found under an evergreen tree early that morning. After arriving in the ER around 7 a.m., he was transferred to intensive care. He was handcuffed to his hospital bed, had an IV warming solution in his arm, and a bladder lavage to raise his temperature. His temperature went down to 87 at one point. It's getting down low. Yeah. That's, that's 10 degrees below normal temp. Right. Normal body temp. So he probably would have died within a few hours. It wouldn't have taken too long. No. He told staff that he had taken 16 tablets of an over-the-counter sedative called Sleepinol, plus a bunch of Vicodin. And he also told them that he'd been drinking whiskey all night. Yep, he was working hard. Macomb County Sheriff's deputies found more of Tyra's remains that day in Stony Creek Metro Park. Over 100 officers combed the area, and they discovered Tyra's hands, feet, and chunks of her flesh scattered all over a narrow stretch of land where Steve had stood and tossed them weeks ago. Later, one of her legs was found. The park was like a horror movie. Well, yeah, this is such a strange thing. It's, it's grotesque, it's gruesome, and it's also weird. It doesn't even make any sense to be tossing them around in the snow. I mean, they would definitely be discovered. Mm-hmm. They would. I mean, once it melts for good. Yeah. Unless he was hoping that animals would eat it. It's in plastic bags a lot, though, right. too. Plus, there'd still be bone fragments. Yeah. Anyway. A warrant charging Steve with uh, open murder and disinterment and mutilation of a body was issued by the prosecutor's office. Oddly enough, after all his denials and his attempts to escape the law, he confessed to killing Tara pretty easily once he was in his hospital room. Like we said earlier, we'll never know for sure what happened at the house that night. Steve's story of an argument that got out of control 
is likely not the whole story. I'm sure it isn't. People don't die that easily if you push them or strike them. No. No. So for three and a half hours, Steve made a full confession to detectives. He said that he strangled Tara. He said that he moved her body to the Isuzu trooper, then took her to his father's shop to chop her up. Now, once he'd done that, he distributed the remains. Then he returned to the park three times, hiding Tara's body parts in the snow and moving parts. And he actually moved the torso several times. He moved it a couple times in the park, then he went, moved it to his father's shop, kept it there till he got worried that the odor would start making people notice it. And then he put it in the storage tank container in his garage. So that's how it happened that Kozlowski couldn't remember seeing that storage container. It wasn't there. Right, exactly. But he was just so self-absorbed. As he told his story, he really lingered on that trip to Myers, where he purchased razor blades and sleeping pills. He was kind of insulted because it was his belief that someone should have been concerned and asked him about these purchases. In April 2007, his confession was released to the public, including the entire conversation he'd had with authorities and a written confession that he gave police. Tara's sister was given control of her estate, and she pretty quickly filed a wrongful death suit against Stephen Grant. In June 2008, Stephen's father, William Allen Grant, committed suicide from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He had been seeking visitation with his two grandkids. That's just a small example of the ripple of pain that goes throughout the families when something like this happens. Yes. On Friday, December 21st, 2007, Steve was found guilty of murder in the second degree. He was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. In March 2010, he lost his final appeal in state court, leaving the original sentence of 50 to 80 years. The Michigan Supreme Court affirmed a lower court decision that found his trial was not unduly prejudiced by pretrial publicity, nor was he improperly denied access to an attorney before making a confession to police. He actually had tried to confess to several police officers who told him, no, don't tell me anything before he finally did spill everything to the uh, detective. In March 2015, U.S. District Court Judge David Lawson denied Stephen Grant's petition for writ of habeas corpus, where he claimed that police improperly obtained his confession in his hospital bed as he was being treated for hypothermia and exposure, and also denied his claim that pretrial publicity made it impossible for him to receive a fair trial. Lawson said that officials in Macomb County took extraordinary measures to ensure that a fair and impartial jury was chosen. The Biography Channel series Casanova Killers and the Investigation Discovery series Scorned Love Kills both featured this case. Also, there have been at least two books written about this case, and we did read both of them. A Slaying in the Suburbs by Andrea Billups and Blood in the Snow by Tom Henderson. And since 2007, Tara's family has held an annual event called Tara's Walk in Sterling Heights, Michigan. With the help of Turning Point, this is an organization that helps provide a safe place for victims of domestic violence, the walk has raised tens of thousands of dollars for domestic abuse programs. Tara's children, who are being raised by her sister, have participated in Tara's Walk each year. Today's show has been sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, you deserve real protection from ADT. Real protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is there for you when you need them. Real protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. No matter how you define safety, ADT is there. ADT. Real protection. Visit ADT.com slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. The music for True Crime Brewery is written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you find yourself wanting more TCB, you can go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and join Team Tie Grabber for access to our members-only episodes. Along with this exclusive access to our large bank of members-only episodes, you will receive a gift from us, 
and also we'll think that you're pretty cool. Oh, of course. You can also go to Patreon and become a patron of True Crime Brewery and get these same benefits, and that includes the presumption of coolness. Now, we recently covered the plot to kill Sharika Adams, who was the pregnant girlfriend of an NFL wide receiver named Ray Carruth. Other members-only episodes include Clara Harris, who drove over her husband with her Mercedes, the crimes of Philip Markoff, and the death of Tina Watson. That's the one where we interviewed an expert scuba diving instructor who had been consulted by Tina's husband's attorney before his U.S. trial for Tina's murder. And there are also a lot more. Some ways for you to show support for True Crime Brewery are to follow us on Twitter at Tigrabber Pods, on Instagram, Tigrabber Podcasts, as well as on Facebook. You can join our True Crime Brewery fan discussions group on Facebook too and get into some really good conversations about past cases or just other topical crime situations. If you enjoy the show, please take a minute to give us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to TCB. That really helps us a lot in finding new listeners. So we're going to move forward with feedback now. Just remember you can send feedback and case suggestions to us in an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com, or you can tell us in your own voice by leaving a voicemail on the leave a voicemail link on the front page of our website, tigrabber.com. The voicemails have been slowing down a little bit since January 1st, so we've decided to extend our get a free t-shirt if we play your voicemail offer until the end of February. So if you have interesting comments or a case suggestion, please leave us a voicemail. And if we play it on the show, you'll get a free t-shirt. So let's start with the voicemails. What have we got, Dick? I have three for you to listen to. The first one is from Holly, and she has a comment on Bridge of Sorrow. That's the two sisters in Wyoming who were kidnapped. Uh, they were thrown off a bridge. Oh. One, one survived. Horrible. Yes. Okay, let's hear what Holly has to say. Hey, Jill and Dick. This is Holly from Chicago. And I just listened to the Bridge of Sorrow episode, and it was completely crushing, completely devastating. And it made me start thinking about the reasons why we are interested in true crime and what this semi-obsession could be about and I just wanted to mention this paradox of, you know, having these horrible feelings and hearing someone's story, but also the need to hear the story or the perceived need to hear the story in order to make sense of our own inner terror, our own dark psyches, as it were. Carl Jung mentioned that we all have a shadow side, and that is probably a pretty good framework to approach ourselves psychoanalytically. Um, but back to the original thought, um, the life that Becky had to live after this horrible event is really soul crushing. And I will be lighting a candle for her and her family today. Um, it is the first year of 2019, and I am just hoping for more positive outcomes for for everyone and that people learn how to channel their shadow sides in ways that aren't um, ending up in violent and cruel acts like this. It's just incomprehensible. Thank you so much. Rest in peace, Becky and Amy. So I, I played that. I just thought it was something that needed to be said. I really, really appreciate her empathy. Yes. It's great. Yeah. And she makes some great points there as well. Definitely does. But I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Holly. It was one of the most heartbreaking cases we've done. It was, because you go from being happy in a sense that the one sister survived and seemed to be leading a, a good life, when in reality she was still pursued by demons and had all sorts of issues and problems, and then to be probably victimized by a psychiatrist who's supposedly there to help her. Oh, I know. I mean, that's, that's just horrifying. Well, I mean, there we are again with the waves and the ripples of pain that just never stop, really. Right. So much to think about. But thank you very much, Holly. Okay. Next one is from Lorena. She has a case suggestion. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Lorena, your friend from Kirkland, Washington. 
First of all, I want to say thank you for doing such a fabulous job with your storytelling and your research. Every week, your hard work shines through. And I've been listening to you guys, I want to say, since about maybe two, three months after you started your podcast. So it's been a pleasure and a joy to listen to you grow. Um, it was It's funny because in the beginning, you both seemed very shy, and now you're so open and uh, more, I guess, with the banter back and forth. It's just, it's, it's nice to hear how comfortable you've gotten with this and how comfortable you are with your listeners. Also, I'm glad to hear that you're settling in well in New Mexico. I'm sure the two of you can find a quiet end anywhere you go. And I did want to make a suggestion on a case. Um, this came about actually because I recently watched the movie Alpha Dog um, with Justin Timberlake. There's a whole bunch of other people in it, too. It's a pretty uh, strong cast. But this is a movie from the early 2000s. And, yeah, I know I'm kind of late to the party, but I watched the movie, and it's uh, based on the murder of Nicholas Markowitz. The names of the characters in the movie have been changed, but, you know, you can Google and pretty much find the real names of all the main players. Um, so Nicholas Markowitz was kidnapped. And this was a kidnapping orchestrated by Jesse James Hollywood, who was a 20-something-year-old drug dealer. I want to say 20 or 21, very young. This was all over a $1,200 drug debt. It was a kidnapping that uh, went horribly wrong. Jesse James had his crew of friends who were also low-level drug dealers. So they all kind of took turns watching Nicholas over a period of about two and a half, three days. Um, he was seen partying with, um, the drug dealers. Um, uh, people claimed that he didn't seem to be in any danger. People were somewhat aware, if not completely aware that he had been kidnapped over a drug debt and not one person contacted the authorities. So that's what makes this case so interesting. After watching the movie, I only found one podcast that uh, covered the story, but I was surprised that no one else had because it's pretty recent. And, you know, Jesse James Hollywood, you would think with that name, um, it would have been uh, more popular, I guess, in the podcast world. But um, I did hear the other podcasts that did cover it and they did good coverage, but I would love to hear your take on it. This did happen in West Hills, California. So let me know if you need help with any California beers. They're widely available here if you can find any uh, down in the Southwest where you're at. Um, that's about it. I rambled enough for you guys. Thank you again for everything that you do. Stay adorable and cheers. Well, thank you, Lorena. Nice letter, huh? Very nice. People are too nice. We don't deserve so. it. So she, she recapped the case pretty nicely. She uh, did. I would just say, yeah, there was there, he was kidnapped due to his stepbrother owing money. Uh, and they were going to release him and let him go back to his home. But then someone uh, said, oh, you know, we'll still be in trouble for kidnapping him. So they made the decision at, at that point, well, then we better kill him. That makes a lot of fucking sense. Doesn't I mean, it? come on. Well, that's so how it, stupid. So they did kill him. They buried him in a, a grave that was way too shallow, and it was close to a popular trail. So his body was found like a couple days after it had been buried. Well, these people were neither kind nor smart. Right. And there were arrests made. One thing that was interesting is that Jesse James Hollywood rabbited, and he was eventually captured five years after his escape in South America in a small town near Rio de Janeiro. So He got far. But he's been caught. All right. I like that case. I'll look into it. Okay. Yeah. Sounds really stupid. Like things really got out of control quickly. Yeah. And this was a child, a 15-year-old? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's horrible. Okay. If you think about it, most, most crimes like this are just stupid. They are. I know. I know. Just a waste of life. For no good reason at all. Just None stupid. whatsoever. Yeah. And, and this next one is similar to that. So this is a case suggestion from Jane. All right. So is this another voicemail or is this a... Our last voicemail for the, the week. Okay. One more voicemail. 
Hi, Jill. Hi, Dick. This is Jane calling from San Francisco, uh, calling with a case suggestion and a beer suggestion. The case suggestion is the Billionaire's Boys Club, which is easy to research, but is not really present in the minds of the public, I think. Uh, partly because I don't think any true crime podcasts have, have touched on it, although I could be wrong. None that I've heard. Um, it's it's relatively complicated. There's a lot of contradictory evidence. And for that reason, I think it would be interesting for you to do. And then also, I have a vested interest. I'm completely biased, and I'd be interested to hear what your conclusions are. Back in the early 90s, my former husband and I owned several bars in the San Fernando Valley, and the commercial landlord for one of them is the mother of the kid who turned state's evidence in this case. And based on my experience of her, I have always frankly assumed that her son was a thousand percent guilty, as was the guy who's still in prison. And I was, I just assumed that the two guys that have had their verdicts overturned were like, far less involved, even though it was the father of one of them who was killed, who was one of the people that was killed. So I'd be interested to hear what your take is on it, because I am completely willing to have my mind changed about that, but just don't have any anyone rational to talk to or to hear from on, on that subject. So then for the beer suggestion, my suggestion is from Mother Earth Brewing Company, and specifically it's Cali Creamen Nitro which you have to have on draft because I'm not even sure that they make it not on draft. They don't. Uh, and it, it is fantastic. Cali Creamen is fine, but the Cali Creamen Nitro is out of this world. If you go to their website, which is MotherEarthBrewCo.com, they've got a locator. And there are quite a number of bars in Arizona that carry it. And now I can't remember if you're in Arizona or New Mexico, but at least take a look. At least see if you can find it because it's it's like well, I I have to say I suspect that um, Dick you probably won't like it because it's probably too mild for you but it's just uh, it's just like so creamy and so yummy for me it, it, it I can't say enough good things about it so again Mother Earth Bruco dot com and use the locator for Cali Cream and Nitro on draft. Uh, love the show. Thanks so much. And uh, keep up the good work. Bye. Thanks, Jane. I've heard of the Billionaire Boys Club. I have too, but I can't really say that I know much about it. I think I, I did see a prime documentary on it once years ago. I knew ago. nothing about it. But basically it was a Ponzi scheme where they enrolled new members and paid off the original members. And who got killed? So the main investor named Ron Levin was killed. and the father of one of the members, whose name was Hidayat Eslaminia, he was killed. Oh, two people were killed. Two people were killed. Okay. Now, weren't you telling me something about the 2018 film the other day? Well, they did a miniseries that, uh, in 1987 that, okay. that had a fairly notable cast, and then they remade it into a 2018 film, and Kevin Spacey was in this film. Not a major role, but nevertheless, he was in the film. And this was when all the uh, the difficulties that Kevin's encountered were starting to be raised up in terms of his sexual abuse of minors. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the film was released to a small number of theaters, and it did a dismal opening. In some one place I read, it was $126 on the first day, and I think 600 bucks for the weekend. Well, I just wonder, is that because of Kevin Spacey, or did the movie suck? Probably both, but I, I, the, <laughs> the, the way it was looked at was that this was a deliberate boycott of the movie because of Spacey's presence in it. Well, good. So, I guess okay. sometimes those boycotts can work. Well, I mean, we don't want to support asshole criminals, do we? No, we don't. No. What about the beer? She seems so excited about that beer. I'll have to try it sometime. Next time. You haven't time, had it, huh? No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't had any uh, Mother Earth beers. Well, next time we're in California, we could for sure get some. Next time we visit the grandkids. Yeah. We'll look for it. Okay. Oh, we could email Jane and ask her which bars have it. Yeah. Maybe she'd meet us at one. You never know. Never know. I'm just always impressed with our people that write it in voicemail, I just have to say. Well, I tell you. They just, just seem a lot smarter and more well-spoken than I feel like I am, so it's great. Well, just listen to them. They are. 
<laughs> Thanks, Dickie. All right, let's get to our emails. So now we have three emails. Okay. Uh, and the first one's a case suggestion from Jamie. Okay. So I'll read that if you want. Go ahead. Jamie says, hello, I'm a big fan of your podcast. You both have nice, soothing voices, perfect for podcasting. And I also love the respect you seem to have for each other, even when you disagree. Well, we have to, because we disagree a lot, right? So we have to respect each other. We, we do, although usually over minor difficulties. Oh, well, totally, yeah. So she goes on. I have a case suggestion for you, the case of Kristen Gilbert a nurse at the VA hospital in Northampton, Massachusetts, and a serial killer. She murdered several patients, maybe more than several, causing cardiac arrest so that they would code, and she and her affair partner, who also worked at the hospital, could be part of the team called to help with the code. This case, while horrific on its own, holds a personal interest to me because my husband's family suspects that his grandfather may have been murdered by this woman. He was a patient at the VA during the time she was active and died under similar circumstances. Thanks for considering the case and thanks for many hours of great podcasting. So this is a kind of a shock to me because that's from up where we lived for years and years. And I don't think I ever heard of it. No, it was, what is it, 20 years or so ago? Maybe 30. Oh, so it's kind of an it, older case. It is. It is. I mean, she was convicted of killing four people. But authorities think she might have been responsible for as many as 80 deaths. Wow. So that, that's fairly prolific. And she killed them by giving them huge doses of adrenaline in their IV bags. And if you're elderly and have a heart that's not in the greatest shape to get a blast of adrenaline, it just shuts it down. And as was mentioned in Jamie's letter, at least at the time, adrenaline was untraceable. Oh, but you can trace it now? Well, you, you can. You just have to know that you're looking for it. And, and when you do like a toxicology screen or something like that, I'm not sure it's typically on there. So you'd have to have a suspicion. Well, they must have gotten some suspicion, which makes me think she probably did kill more people than she was convicted of oh, killing. Oh, she had to have. Yeah. But I, I think it sounds like a good case. And many of them veterans? They all which are. Is, it was a VA hospital. Which is horrible. These are people who have already put their lives up to keep us safe. We can comment on that a lot. Veterans get the short end of the stick a lot of times in terms of health care, medical care. Well, yeah, hopefully there are improvements in that. And I wouldn't just blanket statement that, but there have been issues with it for sure. Yes. But I do think um, that's a case I would like to cover. I do enjoy the ones with the medical aspect because it always gives us a lot to talk about. It does. We'll look into that. Actually, I already started doing some research, so I'm, I'm going to add her to our list. Okay, great. So we'll be doing her sometime in 2019. All right. The next email is from Camille. You want me to read this and you can read the next one, okay? Okay. So this is a comment from Camille, as you said, I think. Did you say that? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Camille says, I'm sure you are aware of the Chris Watts case in Colorado. He pled guilty to the murders of his pregnant wife, Shanann, and his two little daughters. I've been watching a YouTube mark maker. I've been watching a YouTube maker named Armchair Detective. He is analyzing the security cam video of the next door neighbor. And this CCTV did have a view of the Watts' driveway. So uh, Armchair Detective showed a clip of the video in which Chris Watts is walking to his truck from his house. And there appears to be another figure in the video. It looks like a woman. Her jeans are darker than Chris's jeans, and she has a feminine walk. She had a bubble butt, while Chris has a flat butt, and she has long brown hair. The video is from the early morning of the murders. So if I was Nancy Grace, I'd say, bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Chris killed his family because he was having an affair with a woman named Nicole Kessinger. She seemed to be pressuring him, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to get rid of his family. She told him she wanted to get married and start fresh, and she might not be able to stay with him because he had already had children. So Chris took a plea asking that Nicole not be brought into the case. Now the video may show that she was there when the murders were committed, which would make her an accomplice or accessory. The interesting thing, my words, when Armchair Detective put this analysis on YouTube, 
someone contacted YouTube asking for it to be taken down. What? Yeah. So also, on the morning of the murders, Chris called his children's preschool to say the children wouldn't be coming back. Yeah, I knew that. He said he and his family were moving or selling the house or whatever. This was at 8.15, and at 8.30, the school reported that a woman called claiming to be Shanann's mother and said, don't worry, the kids are fine. The call was not made by her mom, and it is unlikely that it was Chris's mom. Chris's mom, I think, would not have wanted her grandchildren dead, so I don't think she was involved, although she is a dreadful person. Hmm. Another YouTube maker named Jewels of Thought was talking about this weird phone call, and someone sent her hateful mail demanding that she not speak of the phone call. Nicole Kiss Kessinger has made threats to sue people on YouTube for making comments about her. So it seems likely or at least possible that the mistress was actually involved in the murders. She looks just like the figure walking in a cat-like way out to the truck. I would like to ask that you look into these matters for a show. It's a fascinating case. If it is her in the video, people need to contact the DA in that county. They may be investigating Nicole at this point, but that's anybody's guess. Thank you. I enjoy your podcast. I wonder if Colorado has any good beer. Well, yes, they do have good beer. We were just there several months ago for our niece's wedding. Actually, we were there at the time that this whole Chris Watts thing happened on the news. We were. When he had reported her missing. So, of course, this is a huge case right now. I don't really know much about it. I've been following the cases we do on the podcast. I've been busy with that. But we are covering this case the end of February, so we will start to investigate it soon. Yes, it's going to be on. We have accessed some documents on the case, but I don't know anything about what she's telling us here, but it does sound really intriguing. What do you think? Oh, it does. I mean, just the uh, sort of witness tampering type stuff going on. Well, I can't imagine that he could get a plea deal to leave her alone if she was actually involved. Well, I would agree with that. I guess they could, you could get that plea deal if they hadn't seen the video or, or didn't have any reason to suspect her involvement. Right. But I would think that uh, the deals go out the window if there is involvement. Yeah, and I don't want to go into it too much because we don't really know anything no, about it right gotta, now. got to do some work on this. But it's definitely a fascinating case that we will be doing. And we when I read that will. letter, I really thought it was interesting. Yeah, that's why I put it in. Good call. And I would just like to echo for Camille. She must not be that much of a beer drinker because she would know that Colorado has lots of good beer. Colorado has a lot of great stuff. I think we would have moved there if it had been warmer. They just have too much snow. There's still winter up there, babe. Very wintry, yeah. yeah. I'm not into that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, do we just have one more email? One more email. This is from Don. This is a fascinating tale. So. And he wants us to use his last name, I guess. He's okay with that. Usually we don't read people's last name, but it's in the letter, so. Yes, it's in the letter. So we're safe reading it. Mm-hmm. Okay. My name is Don W. Boner, and my birth name was James Arnold Bowman in 1949, Jasper, Marion County, Tennessee. My mother, Flossie Bowman, was a 20-year-old barmaid who gave birth to me about two months early at Wright's Clinic in Jasper. From the time I was born, spotters associated with Wright's Clinic, Mary Hawkins Wright, and Marion County Welfare Representative Margaret Hall repeatedly urged Flossie forcefully to place me up for adoption with the Tennessee Children's Home Society and the infamous Georgia Tan headquartered in Memphis, Tennessee. My mother refused, even in writing, in May 1949, stating she would never surrender a child for adoption. The representatives continued their harassment and demands into September 1949, in early September 1949, Georgia Tan sent a letter to my would-be adoptive parents that she would soon have a child for them. On or about September 15, 1949, Flossie received a call from Wright's clinic stating that I had died at the clinic and they would take care of the remains for her. Two of my cousins witnessed the call that Flossie received. I was secreted to the Chattanooga chapter of TCHS while my documents and history were fabricated. My mother's signature on the consent for adoption was forged. In early December 1949, I was transferred to Tan's home in Memphis. 
and three days later to the Nashville chapter of the TCHS pending juvenile civil hearing, granting the TCHS custody of me for the purpose of adoption. No family member was notified of the hearing and required process service of the civil action was probably done by publication. In early January 1950, I was taken by train to Los Angeles, California, and the Biltmore Hotel to be surrendered to my adoptive parents for $5,000. My adoptive parents knew there were problems with the adoption. Between 1951 and 1956, we moved three times in Southern California. The final time was 250 miles north to Exeter, California. My adoptive parents had decided not to tell me I was adopted and instructed my relatives to never reveal it to me. When I was seven, my cousin told me I was adopted and my mother was forced to admit that I was adopted. I was told a number of ridiculous stories, but they said they never knew who my parents were or what my birth name was. In November 2008, that was proven to be a lie when my daughter accidentally found an envelope in my mother's effects stating on its face, do not open until after our deaths. Inside was my adoption order stating the alleged names of my parents and my birth name of James Arnold Bowman. My Tennessee families never knew I survived. On May 7, 2009, I found my biological family, later verified by DNA maternal and paternal testing. I found I had a rich family history as well as a brother and a sister. I lost my brother six months before our family reunions in Tennessee. My birth mother and father were already deceased. I now enjoy a wonderful relationship with my sister Linda and surviving relatives. It is written the TCHS is responsible for over 5,000 child abductions and hundreds of deaths, if not more, due to starvation, disease, and neglect. I am here to tell you it is much more. My TCHS number is 7,702. Nothing has ever been done for the victims of this evil woman who rightfully died of cancer in September 1950. Tennessee continues to this day to ignore the surviving victims, trying to forget the TCHS ever happened, and refuses any attachment of culpability for complete, complicit sanction of this criminal entity. In 2014, I published my book, Whatever Happened to Baby James? Check it out. I think you'll enjoy it and it provides a detailed, documented insight into the workings of the TCHS. It's listed on Amazon Books. Thank you for this opportunity to bring my story to True Crime Brewery. And I know it's kind of a plug for his book, but I feel okay about that, because that is just a fascinating story. But still, just to have an actual story. When we talked about this, we were reporting of the numbers of kids that were given up for adoption, that were taken from their homes illegally, kids that were killed or died and, and buried somewhere, but now you have an actual survivor. I know, right? Yeah. Well, and the thing is, we've done, we're getting close to 200 podcasts now that we've done, and this one I will never forget. This is just a fascinating, very upsetting piece of history, really, and his story is a part of history. It is. So it's definitely worth a read. I'll be reading it. We'll get Plus, it. just the fact that he is so open with this whole thing, I just really have to commend Don on writing to us and sharing this with us. Because it really must be hard, because it kind of makes his adoptive parents not look so great. As well as Georgia Tan, of course, and the whole just corrupt system. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So thanks, Don. And thank you to everyone who wrote in and who left a voicemail. You're all really cool and smart. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so take care, and we will see you all next time. Where? The quiet end, of course. At the quiet end. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, guys.
Bye bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Peoples. Gerbils. Gerbils. <laughs> Hamsters. <laughs>